for being here today, guys. Um, very much looking forward to this. I know we've tried to get this one going, so excited to hear about this. Yeah, and thank you, Jenna, for that intro. And uh, I want to encourage everybody else who's still coming in, uh, please keep introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, just say who you are um, and what is one question you would like us to answer. If, if you had one one thing you want to hear about. Um, so that, oh, here's my slide. So that, that helps with my, my next slide. So who's here? Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about um, myself and um, the others of us who are speaking. But I, I do want to acknowledge up front that we're going to be telling the story of about 10 years of history here. And like it, it, it looks like it's a couple of white guys doing everything. But it's really the story of a lot of people uh, that we're all going to acknowledge throughout. But um, if you want to learn more, I really encourage you to look at the resources at the end because there's a lot more to read, a lot more to see about what's happening in computer science, uh, in CPS, and going forward. So um, I'm Andy Rasmussen. I'm the project developer for the Office of Computer Science at Chicago Public Schools, uh, where I've been for a little bit over five years. Um, and I'll let my colleagues Stephen and Dale say a little bit about themselves. I'm Dale. I was born at a very young age. Mm -hmm. uh, to my parents, I am teaching computer science at UIC and have been involved for the last uh, oh, 13 years with this effort. My name is Steve McGee. I'm president of the Learning Partnership. We're an independent research organization that uh, is partnering with CPS on the CS for All initiative and have been involved for a little over a decade with this initiative. Great. Um, so to start off, um, the question is why computer science? Why computer science for all? Might not be a point I have to make too hard with this particular audience, but it helps to ground us in where things are right now so we can see where we would like to be. And the, the bare fact is that there are huge inequities in terms of who participates in computer science, both in K through 12 and also beyond. And a couple of statistics that I have here are from uh, the topper from code.org about participation in APCS. Um, this is across the board, across the country. It's one of the only sort of broad metrics that we have of participation in K-12. Um, but we see that the number of students who are taking APCS exams in high school, um, the percentage of those students who are female is like still under 30%. These are a year or two out of date, but the numbers are not shifting uh, closer to 50% uh, as we would like. And also in terms of underrepresented minorities in computing who are taking AP computer science in high school, that has was steady for a very long time in the low teens. And with the launch of the AP computer science principles uh, exam about four years ago now, um, there was a jump um, in terms of who was participating in APCS principles because it was really designed to be a course that was inclusive of everybody. But we still see that that number is about in the low 20s, which is still pretty out of whack with where things are in the country as a whole. And these disparities in K through 12 translate directly into who participates and who has access and opportunities in the workforce. So that low 20s number of um, women in computing in K-12, that's really reflected in uh, the workforce as well. So this is from a, a government report of the technology sector writ large. This is about five years ago, and I believe uh, the progress has been from about 22% to about 24% since then, uh, females in the technology space. And similarly for um, white versus workers versus non-white workers, the numbers have held pretty steady and there are big changes that need to happen earlier in the pipeline, so to speak, in order for this picture to change. And if we look at Chicago in particular, so like many cities, there's a big digital divide in terms of who has access to technology as well as a lot of other resources in the city. So over on the left is a chart from a few years ago of broadband internet access by community area in the city of Chicago. And you see there's a big green swatch up top uh, which is along the lakeshore and in the north side neighborhoods. And that indicates lots of broadband access. And the red swatches are on the west and south and southwest sides of the city. And it's a bit of a crude metric for things relating directly to computer science, but it does reflect 
um, also in terms of what we see here on these other maps, which have to do with income in the city. So again, there's a distribution of the same areas that have high broadband internet access are those that have high household income. And if you look at a map of race in the city of Chicago, where you see those like brightly delineated areas indicating the very segregated nature of the city, we see that those uh, geographic lines map pretty closely onto each other. So there are big differences in terms of who has access to resources, and that translates into who has access to computer science education. And if you think about where all the, the new earnings are, where the new opportunities are in terms of the workforce, in terms of what you can do after, uh, your, after K through 12, those opportunities are predominantly in the technology fields and fields that are supported by technology. So if we don't do something, uh, there are going to be perpetuations of all these inequities at every level. So, and a little bit about Chicago Public Schools, um, for those of you not familiar. So we have 642 schools in CPS. A uh, little over 100 of those are charter schools and the rest are managed directly by the district. There are about 165 high schools and about four times as many elementary schools. We serve, uh, this year, the final numbers are a little bit in flux uh, because a lot of metrics are different due to remote learning, but uh, we're at a, in the 340 student, 340,000 student range. Um, and hold in your mind, that's about 19,000 students per grade level in the district. And the district and the city are predominantly Hispanic or Latinx and African-American. Um, and the majority of our students are economically disadvantaged, and we have a good fraction that are English language learners. So there are about 18, 19% of our students who speak another language at home, uh, which corresponds roughly to the proportion of the city that are uh, immigrants. So about just over a fifth of the city are foreign born. Um, and I, I tend to give this for non-school audiences, so I'm not gonna go into like what the different kinds of schools are. Um, anyway, you came here for the story of CS for All at Chicago Public Schools. And that's what we're going to get into. So a very quick sketch from the district's perspective in terms of where some of the major numbers are. Uh, if you look back about 10 years, uh, computer science was really only offered in about 20 of the selective enrollment high schools and those that had a, a vocational or a CTE focus. Um, there was probably some, but no elementary school computer science at a systemic level to speak of. And we had about 2000 students enrolled in those computer science classes in high school, again, primarily on the AP or CTE track. And we had about 30 or so low thirties computer science teachers at the time. Fast forward to now, uh, 10 years later, we now offer computer science to students at all 111 of our district run high schools and a couple of the charter schools are included in there for CPS reasons. We have over 200 elementary schools that are offering computer science at some level. And we have, uh, just in high school, there are over 20,000 students a year, that's unique students across high school, that are taking a computer science course. So note on the previous slide, 19,000 students per grade level, 20,000 total per year taking computer science. And our computer science teacher population has also exploded. We've gone from about 30 to almost 300 high school computer science teachers. And the logo and the woman that I have there in the middle, that's uh, Brenda Darden Wilkerson, who was the instigator of this movement within Chicago Public Schools and more broadly. So uh, she can get the credit for the words computer science for all being attached to the initiative. Uh, that was back in 2013. Um, and she was really the reason that our department exists and things happened within the district. We're also gonna talk about some of the, the external partnerships that we have as far as getting things started. Um, it's been a few years since Brenda was at CPS, but we have to really acknowledge the work that she and others put in in those early years. Uh, and a quick timeline is that um, the motivation for CS4 really started about 2008. That's when people began to think like, this is something that should happen or needs to happen for our students because at the time um, people were be it was becoming clear that um, these inequities in terms of participation in computer science were um, an issue and they were happening in CPS. Uh, 2011 was the first funding that appeared to actually uh, help move things along and get teacher professional development and so forth. 
um, 2013 was really when the department started to be formed, the initiative got a name, and the team really began to form within the district. It took another two or three years before the district enacted its graduation policy. So computer science is now a graduation requirement for students at CPS. Happened uh, almost five years ago now, February 22nd, 2016. And this year, 2020, uh, we managed to pull it off, remote learning and all. Um, we are giving ourselves a 99.7% success rate at the moment. That's like preliminary unofficial reporting, but that's the degree to which we fulfilled that graduation requirement collectively for our students this past school year. So CS is for all, and we're going to say a little bit more about how that came to be and where we're going from there. So alongside this, we have another timeline, and I'll uh, transition over to Dale and Stephen to tell some of the uh, story of the people and the projects behind this. I'm going to piggyback on a statement that Andy made earlier about why computer science I had a chance to hear Carl Reed, executive director of NISBE, the National Society of Black Engineers, last week it was in a session put together by Doris Espiritu from Wright College. And he told a story that he was in a washroom, like at an airport. And I don't know if you've been to O'Hare, it's all the sinks lined up. And he went and to wash his hands and, uh, and the water didn't come out. You know, that happens sometimes the sensor's broken on a particular sink. So went to the next one, that one was also broken. Went all the way down the line, none of them were working. And he was just about to give up and he was gonna walk out and then uh, he's black. A white guy comes in, puts his hand, it works fine. And it turns out it didn't work for him because he has black skin. That's the reason, they weren't broken, they were just calibrated for somebody who's white. So there are products that because we don't have a diverse population that is creating them and testing them, then our products aren't as good. It affects the bottom line for companies to say nothing of justice and inequity issues. So ultimately, when we talk about programs and all these things, ultimately it's about people and the effect on their lives and the opportunities that they have. Back in 2008, there was a group of Chicago computer science teachers at a conference called SIGSI. Um, and at one of the meetings, one of them stood up and said, hey, we need help in Chicago. And then somebody else across the room stood up and said, hey, I'm from Chicago. And the third person, I'm from Chicago too, we should talk. So they got together and, and um, out of that and some other efforts, the Chicago CSTA was formed, CSTA, Computer Science Teachers Association. Some of you are familiar with that. And, and that group started meeting and, and talking and saying, well, we need a systemic way to have computer science in Chicago public schools. And then somebody asked the question, well, what if a, what if a principal says, yeah, I wanna do it in my school, give me some curriculum. We realized, well, we didn't have curriculum for that. And so, um, Don Yannick, one of the teachers, he's shown in the, the top there in, in the middle and the little goatee, another white male. He said, well, I heard about this thing called exploring computer science and we can go to the professional development out in Los Angeles. So another, so I'm at UIC and then Ron Greenberg in the lower left there, he is um, from Loyola and he had some grant funding to help fund the trip. And so three of us went out there, went through the professional development. And I'm curious of the people on the call, how many of you have been in professional development before? You can either turn your camera on and raise your hand, or you can go to click on participants button near the bottom and go over and actually raise your hand like that. So it shows up on your screen. How many of you have ever been to professional development? Jason says, yeah, I've been there. And anyone else? Chadra has been in professional development. The rest of you have never had that particular joy, possibly. Okay, just give it another second. Some of you are like, what? What, I have to participate here? Wait a second. Wait, I gotta close my email, come back over here. Okay, so um, so yeah, a bunch of you have been in professional development. So professional development, it can cause some people to shudder because they have in mind, I have to sit here and I'm forced to finish so that I can get credit for it or whatever the thing might be. But there's often not this anticipation of joy with professional development. That was us going out there. We're like a uh, week long. We can make it, it's California, it'll be sunny. We can walk around afterwards. But boy, were we surprised. At the end of the first day, we were disappointed because it was really exciting and it was engaging and we were doing things and we were talking with each other. It was really great. So we thought we need this for Chicago. So we started uh, working on bringing ECS to Chicago and ECS is the foundation of what we'll talk about later, the graduation requirement for computer science in Chicago. So, uh, so that was the beginning. We started writing some grants and there was a group of us uh, getting together doing this and they were unsuccessful and we worked hard at it. So Brenda was involved there at the beginning. Um, Ron, as I mentioned, 
uh, another CPS teacher, Jeff Solon, and Baker Frankie, who then since went on to code.org. And I remember sitting around the table looking at each other glumly after being rejected for the second time for NSF. And we said, you know what? Even if we don't get grant funding, this is the right thing for the children in Chicago. Giving them these chances, this is the right thing. We wanted to provide a relevant and compelling computer science experience for every child in Chicago. So we thought this is the right thing. If we get grant funding, we can do it better, we can do it faster, but even if we can't, if this is the right thing, we should just do it. So we just started working on it. Lucia got involved. She's really great at grants. So the third time around, we did get grant funding. There in the picture is also uh, Gail Chapman and um, why am I spacing on her name? Uh, Joanna Good, who were the authors of the ECS curriculum. And so they started coming out to Chicago and giving us these engaging experiences and getting everybody fired up about it. So Brenda, brought the sort of top-down approach to the effort. And we had these teachers that were involved early on bottom up. So trying to come at it from both sides, systemically with what Brenda was doing through CTE at the time, and then teachers who were just prototyping and trying things in their classrooms. Uh, yeah, so NSF didn't want just practice. NSF, National Science Foundation, also wanted research and we were looking at each other thinking, well, we're good at the practice part of it. We're doing ECS and that's good. But the research part of it, we're like, oh, how are we going to do that? Ron said, kept saying, you know, there's this guy now up at Northwestern, Stephen McGee, the learning partnership. And he kept saying Stephen McGee. And we're like, okay. And we started talking to Stephen. And Stephen was the answer to this question of research. He came alongside and had all these ideas of, well, have you thought about researching this? No, we haven't. How about this? and uh, was the, the answer for us for that question. Uh, around 2015, the mayor made the announcement that computer science was gonna become a graduation requirement in Chicago, which was like the answer to our prayers. We were very excited about that and then realized, oh, now instead of having to worry about that, we have to worry about teachers being required to teach it who didn't wanna teach it otherwise. And then with that, I'll turn it over to Stephen to talk about the latter part of what happened since then in the chronology. Thanks, Dale. Um, I think one of the things that you'll maybe notice about the what Dale has shared is there's a lot of sort of flying under the radar because the whole CS for All movement hadn't really gotten off the ground. But when at the time that it became a graduation requirement was also the time that the CS for All movement really started. And I think the month before the announcement of the graduation requirement is when Obama had given his speech about CS for All and promised $5 billion for the CS for All movement. And so it was really important that this group had formed and sort of spent time developing a strategy. Because after that, then it just, the whole initiative became bombarded with all different kinds of curricula and approaches. And, um, that we as a group remain committed to exploring computer science as a foundation for the initiative. The other thing that, that really uh, sort of launched our, the, the initiative was when NSF created the CS for All Research Practice Partnership Program. So we were able to get one of the inaugural grants and create, formalized ourselves as the Chicago Alliance for Equity and Computer Science. So that allowed us to then create the support structure and research around this graduation requirement. And was, you know, we we're really able to support the growth of the Office of Computer Science through research and, and partnerships. And as the initiative grew, we began to, to run into other issues around, hey, if a student fails the class, they need to recover the credit to be able to graduate. So we've been really looking at credit recovery in Chicago. And then more recently, we've been able to rally around um, how do we support teachers in um, teaching remotely. So that, that's a brief timeline. All right, thank you, Dale and Stephen. Um, and I wanna comment that like, this slide is all kinds of like faces and logos and other nonsense in it. Um, and in the slides that I shared, I'm planning to like add some links and some um, like names and institutions to make things more clear, uh, but look for that in a day or two after the fact, if you want to find out who people are. 
Um, and I, I just made a note, like I'm there in 2015. That's when I uh, first started as an intern in the uh, CS for All department at the time. Um, and Troy Williams, who's um, above the 2016 mark, he's also here in the call. He's our uh, director uh, for the Office of Computer Science, as we are now known. Um, really, he's he's further over on the left there, but he's kind of a boomerang. So he was a um, going to be well telling Troy's story a little bit. But anyway, he's he's been there from the very early years as well. And oh, wrong window. And uh, just a little bit of a taste of like some of the scale of the growth that we've seen as a result of some of these early uh, policy and partnership initiatives. So focusing on the Exploring Computer Science course, which has been the bedrock of our high school computer science um, initiative, uh, looking at the number of ECS students over time. So 2013 is when uh, CTE at Chicago Public Schools, where uh, Brenda Wilkerson was at the time, uh, switched from using an older Fundamentals of IT curriculum to using the ECS curriculum for their students. So we claimed those initial couple of thousand students. So that has grown steadily year by year. Uh, so the blue bars are number of students enrolled in ECS over time. And the red bars are cumulatively how many students have taken this particular course. And this is not counting APCS principles, APCSA, other CTE IT courses uh, beyond the introductory level, and a few other computer science courses that have popped up over time. So we see in the 2016 to 17 range, there's a huge jump. And that was the first year of the policy being a real thing. So there was some, some growth in those initial years, but really the policy kickstarted things. And also the other big jump happens from 2019 to 2020, which was the final year of schools getting a chance to catch up and offer computer science to all their students. Um, and we see a little drop off this year for, for two reasons that I'll mention. One is there are some schools that offer year, a year's worth of credit in the second semester. Second semester hasn't happened yet. And also there's uh, more options starting to happen at schools. So schools are starting to diversify their initial introductory computer science offerings a little bit. So there's some interplay between that and the exploring computer science enrollment. And again, for this year, we have about 20,000 and change students currently enrolled in computer science in high school. So that means there are about 5,000 students in some other flavor of computer science course um, past the introductory level or an alternative to ECS. And I'll also mention that this presentation has been edited for length and clarity somewhat. And there's a whole other story to tell about elementary school computer science. So uh, Kinga, one of our teachers, I see you. I'm sorry, we're not going to spend as much time in elementary school time, school um, computer science as I would like. But the difference is there's uh, not a policy support for computer science in elementary school. It's something that schools are doing if they want to, that teachers are doing if they want to. And we have about half of our schools right now have a technology teacher or another teacher who's teaching computer science in some fashion. And they do that in a number of ways through a diversity of curriculum and physical and digital tools. Um, that's another story for another time. The one thing I'll call out that has a relationship to the CAFE CS partnership that we're talking about is uh, Scratch Encore. That's the middle school computer science curriculum that has been developed in partnership with UChicago uh, as a part of another research practice partnership. Uh, and that focuses on giving students at that level something to take them beyond the introductory experience that a lot of students have really, uh, there are a lot of introductory experiences, I'll say. There are a lot of hour of code events, a lot of curriculum that's like everybody's first start, but where do you go for that slightly more nuanced or slightly more uh, in-depth computer science coursework for middle school? So that's scratch on core there. But how did it really happen? What are, what are we saying? So. It, these, um, these next couple of slides are very high level, like things that we've learned over the years. So some of our main takeaways that we have reflected on and learned are important to the work that we have done and continue to inform the work that we do. Uh, so I think I'll pass it back over to Stephen for a couple of these. Yeah, there was a question earlier in the chat around what was most challenging and I, I think as Dale had alluded to, sort of the getting started was really quite a challenge. I, I think as I alluded to as well, I think the real challenge came as we gained success, that there was a lot of push to uh, sort of try different things or add different things. And I think, you know, we've all experienced over the years sort of uh, uh, reform, you know, almost like reformitis, like every two or three years was the new thing to try. 
which we certainly have experienced attempts at that uh, within this program. But you know, over a decade of time to really be zeroed in on you know one sort of foundational approach uh, was really important, and we sort of uh, use as a metaphor in that early days the idea of barbecue. And what's really important about barbecue is it's you start uh, uh, slow and low, that it takes a long time and it's the very beginning. It doesn't seem like a lot of stuff is is happening. But what happens is that, that you create this protective layer around the, the meat, and then the inside is actually sort of the ideal conditions to, to um, develop the flavor. And that's really what that early days allowed us to create a group of uh, committed uh, practitioners and researchers to the initiative that created that protection as outside forces uh, then and now continue to try to shape and um, subvert what we're trying to accomplish. So I think that's an important element of thinking about policy is you need to think about what's the right time to enact the policy. And I think the, the graduation requirement I think came at a good time because we had spent four years sort of developing what this initiative would be. And even though at the time the graduation requirement was enacted, only 40% of the high schools even offered a computer science class. There was a process in place that gave confidence and uh, that there was a path to success that ultimately led to the success where we went from 40% of the high schools to 100% of the high schools eventually offering that. So I think that's one major point is um, starting slow, building capacity, you know, building that partnership, and then you can start to really enact um, important policies. So I think the next slide, Andy. Uh, so the other metaphor, uh, and I guess I can take credit for this because I grew up in Cincinnati uh, in the 70s. And at the time, the big red machine or the Cincinnati Reds were one of the dominant uh, teams in baseball. And what was really crucial for the ongoing success of the, the Reds was their farm team. That as, because uh, they, they didn't actually have a very big payroll at the time, but they had a very strong farm team. So even as the All-Stars, you know, left and went on to another uh, team, there was always somebody coming up in the ranks from the, the minor league team to um, take, take on the position within the team. And so very similarly, the ECS professional development program serves in a very similar capacity because um, as you know, with, with many um, school districts, there's a lot of turnover, um, both teachers leaving the district, but also just turnover in terms of who's teaching, you know, what class and even within a school, you can sort of shift things around. So there's a need to have a system in place to have continual professional development so that as teachers stop teaching ECS at a particular school that you have other folks who can then um, go through the professional development and step in to um, take to lead that class. <clears throat> so I think those are two key takeaways from um, you know what we've learned through this initiative. <clears throat> so, go to the next slide Andy. Thanks Stephen. Um, and another point that we'd like to underscore is that uh, CS education systems need to be rooted in policy. Uh, if there's gonna be CS for all, the policy has to be there and that kind of support needs to be there. Otherwise it won't truly be for all. It'll be available to all perhaps, but not for all. And that 99.7% number that I quoted earlier on, that's kind of the, the, the grade we're giving ourselves for the first go round, for the first implementation of, the, of a graduating cohort taking a computer science class. Um, I'll, I'll comment there were waivers granted to some students for their participation in CTE and IB programs. So if they had kind of a rigid program of study, they were allowed to get a waiver for this. But otherwise, every student, no matter what, um, is expected to take a computer science course before they graduate. So the system caught up and that happened uh, with strong policy support and strong support from our research partners as well. And over on the right, uh, the 45% number is what I pulled from the code.org uh, landscape report, which they called um, illuminating disparities, I think, this time around. So every year code.org um, polls uh, states and districts around the country to see how many 
of our schools are offering the computer science course as well as some other metrics as well as tracking which states have policies to support computer science education. And in Illinois, um, according to this report, 45% uh, of our high schools are offering a computer science course. And that's, that's offering a course, and that's not necessarily every student at that school. And well, I'm, nobody's personally in touch with every one of the 850 some districts that there are in Illinois. So we know that there are some schools, there are some districts that are also making their own way, making their own things happen. But at the state level, there's very little policy support. So if you go to code.org, uh, that landscape report refers to like nine policies that um, they outline as sort of the bedrock of like having a good basis for computer science policy. And if you look at a map, if you look at other states, Illinois is pretty far behind. So anything that's happening is happening without that state level support that you really need if you're gonna make anything available to all your students and really integrate it into the systems of support that we have for those students. And the logo over there on the right is CS4IL, so I'll say a little bit more at the end, uh, but that's where you should engage if you're interested in helping make some of that policy change that needs to happen. Because uh, things are starting to move, Illinois might start getting its act together, but it's gonna need a lot of support from around the state. And a couple more takeaways. So. Uh, one thing that we learned is very important is that uh, wherever you are, you have to meet people where they are. So every school is different. We have 111 high schools. We have 450 some elementary schools. Every single one is different. And the people are different and the relationships that you have to build are different. And that's really been the core of how we work within the district is everyone's a potential partner. Everybody needs to know or wants to know or can engage in some way. And we can support each other to meet our mutual aims. So. Uh, this is something we've done in various ways through coaching, um, through integrating and uh, connecting with other departments such as CTE and other initiatives that are happening within the district to see how can we work together, how can we align our aims to meet our students' needs. We work with uh, researchers outside the district and other university partners. Uh, we find principals who are advocates at their schools and get them to talk to the other principals, talk shop about how they make it happen. Same for counselors. And everyone at every level can engage, can learn, because um, we all have things to learn from each other and we can all figure out how to make a better system. Um, by the way, those are three of our Exploring Computer Science facilitators, uh, coaches, uh, experts, um, during one of the, I think that's at one of the ECS facilitator retreats that happen every year for um, facilitators around the country. So there's a, a local community that we've built within the district, within central office and, and the teaching force. Um, we also have a community in Chicago, but there's also a national computer science education community and education research community that we connect with and engage with. Some comments about this slide. This was at the at same conference, but now 10 years later in 2018. And it has a large collection of people from all different walks. So there are people here from, uh, from CPS administ administration, CPS teachers, lots of CPS teachers, private schools, public schools, the National Exploring Computer Science, a bunch of different universities, Vanderbilt, Loyola, DePaul, UIC, department heads, as I mentioned, regular teachers, uh, another organization from Massachusetts, all coming together with this common purpose of providing a compelling and relevant computer science experience for the students in Chicago. So the this notion of community and having it be about people has been one of the hallmarks from the from the very beginning. You know, our programs and our policies support people. And I know I sound like a broken record making that point. Um, we want our students to be technology insiders. After one course, a student commented that now when I'm at a party and there's a circle of people talking about technology, I can join the circle and feel like I belong. So we want them to have that sense. Andy, back to you. Thanks, Dale. And so starting to wrap things up a little bit, um, I wanna give a hint of like sort of where we have to go from here. And I'll, I'll use a couple more metaphors um, to guide the way. And right now, one, one way to look at it, uh, I see it through the lens of inclusion and one of opportunity. So, um, on the left is a framework uh, developed by Joanna Good, uh, one of the, the ECS developers. 
um, that was part of the Guide to Inclusive Computer Science Education. So this framework layers that you need to address uh, and build into your systems in order to provide that experience within your district or within your context. So the first dimension is access. So making sure that any student who wants to has the opportunity, because that's a barrier for a lot of students, is that there's just nothing immediately available to them. And once you have access, then you think about diversity. Think about who is taking advantage of the opportunity, who is encouraged to, to take the opportunities and who is not. Um, so that looks different depending on your particular context, but uh, you can always look at demographics, look at how people are being recruited, look at who is teaching the classes. Um, and my comment is that access and diversity are really the two levels that can be most easily or most directly impacted by policies like the graduation requirement policy that we have at CPS. And the third dimension, the third layer is inclusion. So once the students are in the classroom, what happens? Is it a good experience? Because the worst thing that can happen is that a student is in any kind of course, like math, science, computer science, and then it turns them off. Like it's like, I don't like math. Computer science is not for me. English is not for me. That was kind of my experience, but then I came around to it. Like the worst thing is to turn students off from opportunities, from knowledge and enlightenment that, or like knowledge of the world that's available to them. And this is something that traditionally happens in computer science classrooms. Um, and so this is where our North Star has been since the beginning. Like we want to provide a high quality, engaging and relevant computer science experience for all the students in Chicago. And that's why this entire time we've been working on things like coaching, refining the facilitator development model, refining the ways that we work with teachers. And now that the access and diversity elements are, at least for the introductory level, mostly taken care of, I, I'm not going to say we're ever done, but we're able to take some of the attention that we focused on, like making sure schools knew how to offer a computer science course, to making sure that they offer the best computer science experience that they can. So that's through ongoing coaching, ongoing work with the schools on pathways and other kind of opportunities that they provide to students. And the metaphor that I have for this comes from the world of Scratch, which I, I hope many of you are familiar with. But if we think of a student's first computer science experience as one that is in this little box, the ways that we're working and continue to work uh, expand that box for the students. So in the language of Scratch, uh, Scratch is meant to uh, provide a, a low floor with wide walls, meaning that in the Scratch programming environment, as opposed to some other programming environments that might have been students' first experience before things like Scratch came along, um, we're going to lower the floor, like remove barriers to access and participation in this computer science experience, and we want to give students wide walls. So make sure that once they're in Scratch, they've got a big playground. So like Scratch, you can create animations, dance moves, they're always coming up with new blocks and new elements that don't just increase the like computer science content that you can do, but can do like the fun and useful things that you can do within Scratch. And what I'll add to the lowering the floor and widening the walls um, is creating a high ceiling, making sure that students can, once they get that introductory experience, go where they want to go, whatever that looks like. So in our terms, like lowering the floor came from that initial policy level, making sure that barriers to participation are minimized and eliminated, creating wide walls, like making sure that students like in their classes and in their schools have opportunities like in and out of the classroom that they can engage with. And then that high ceiling is thinking about pathways uh, either within their school or in partnership with community colleges, universities, um, industry, creating work-based learning opportunities, making sure that students can get out and do what they want to do. Whether or not it's computer science, hopefully they can make the connection and get something that's meaningful to them. And that's where I'll leave it off. So a, a few of the resources that I'll mention, and I think I'll be adding a little bit to this slide and some of the others after the fact. But so our website is up there. Follow us on Twitter at cs for cps uh, Also, our general catch-all inbox is still cs for all at cps.edu. Uh, the Cafe CS is there, so you can see some of our more academic publications and other resources. The Learning Partnership in particular has uh, a blog and other communication resources that are um, on their brand new shiny NVS 
website um, and maybe wait a day or two to uh, check out their blog because there's a new post for CS Education Week that also highlights uh, some of the work that's been going on. I mentioned CS Frial, I'll mention it again. And I know I see we have uh, Steve Svetlik also in the meeting, um, but this is the state computer science policy advocacy organization. And if you want to learn more, if you want to get involved, um, the website is linked here, cs4il.org, also on Twitter. So things are hopefully beginning to move in our state and now is a good time to get involved. Um, and another thread has been research practice partnerships. So if you want to learn more about how those operate, uh, there are a lot of resources at the NERP National Network of Research Practice Partnerships webpage, um, which is a group that we've um, been fruitfully working with for a couple of years. Andy, I want to jump in here for a second. There was a question from Ms. Mayer. Does CPS have grade level scope sequence support in computer science? Troy, I don't know if you want to comment on that or if you have any other comments as this has been going on. Again, Andy had mentioned Troy is uh, heads up the Office of Computer Science. And while you're thinking about that, Troy, there was another question. Charlie Zimmerman, what was the biggest challenge? Uh, at the beginning, it was getting curriculum and then getting people's attention, but then the challenges have, have shifted over the years. Troy, could you comment on that? And, and Andy, I don't know if you want to comment on that too. Uh, hello. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the first question had to do with uh, resources, scope and sequence uh, for computer science. Yeah, so um, as Andy alluded to earlier, uh, in the K-8 space, it's uh, a little bit willy-nilly uh, because there isn't necessarily a requirement, but our K-8 team does an awesome job of providing curricular resources, professional development, um, digital resources uh, to e each school is different. Um, they have different capacity, different funding, um, different sizes, different uh, teacher resources. So uh, we, we have recommendations and uh, we provide support based on what that particular school's leadership and teachers uh, have a vision for, for their students as it pertains to computer science. In the high school space, it's, it's similar. Yes, we have a graduation requirement, but um, we, it's kind of a customization. So we have a high school integration specialists who work with the administration and the teachers to determine what might work best for them. And we point them in the right direction as far as a potential uh, a sequence of courses that um, uh, will get the outcomes that they are looking for uh, and serve the interest of their students. Um, what was the second question, Dale? I'm sorry. <laughs> That was it, the scope and sequence. And there not there also like a CSTA has the curriculum guidelines, which has uh, some, some information in it. And then there's another one that's been adopted from that. I don't remember the name of it right off the top of my head. Yeah, Andy, do you remember? I don't know. I'm putting it in the chat. Okay, thank you. So there's the computer science standards and the framework as well, and I'll link. Oh, Julia's on the call. I'm sorry to call you out, Julia. <laughs> Did I miss anything? <laughs> so I was just going to say that CS is not like the other content areas in, in which they haven't had a, a buildup of exposure from year to year. Um, we do encourage teachers to to jump in where they feel comfortable as we build the framework to move forward and build their capacity. So we do rely on the CSTA standards because they are banded, but we don't necessarily expect, for example, a eighth grader to jump in at the two level standards. For those of you who know um, what that means, that's like the third level of, of, of CSTA standards. We still acknowledge that, that many have a gap in, in their knowledge because they've just never been exposed and we don't want to we don't want to penalize students for something that they've never had access to. And so as we build that, as we build um, that experience from year to year, bringing on stronger and better content, then that's when we can start looking at sequences that build on prior years. For right now, we're just focusing on exposure and making sure that the teachers have their professional development and that the content is built to the students um, like their reading level and their grade level in terms of like, can they access the curriculum materials? 
but really it's just making sure everybody has an experience. And now that we have more students that are going through potentially more than one year, we're layering on other things that they could participate in, like uh, district level um, uh, competitions and events, as well as after school programs, summer school programs. So we're really trying to wrap around the students in more than one uh, mode of learning, if that makes any sense. And to piggyback off of uh, what Holy and Troy have shared, from the research side, you know, there's there's real opportunity to be data driven and thinking about sequences. So with our, our partnership with CPS, we're able to track what are the pathways that students take, uh, particularly through high school and the different courses that they take, and then look at the outcomes based on the different pathways that students take. Um, and one of the reports that uh, we just released the pre-publication for is that um, those students who take the ECS class prior to taking AP CSA are three and a half times more likely to pass the exam with a three or higher. So we're starting to see that ECS plays a foundational role in preparing students, particularly those that have never had exposure to computer science, preparing them to be successful in um, sort of the, the foundational AP class for computer science. So I think we have a few more minutes still for um, questions if people wanna pop in with anything. Yes, and anybody feel free to come off mute and uh, come on camera if you want to definitely uh, ask those questions at this point, so. Hi, this is Charlie Zimmerman uh, from Limestone Community High School in the Peoria area. What uh, is your introductory class at the high school level uh, for computer science? Are you looking, you know, really getting into heavy lines of code or is it more of an introductory for the graduation requirement piece? Uh, Troy, do you want to take it or do shall I? You can go ahead. Right. So uh, the ECS course that I mentioned, Exploring Computer Science, is a, a broad introductory course. So uh, there are roughly six units. Um, the, the first four are the real core of the course. And so that starts off with human-computer interaction in general. What is a computer? What is computing? How does it relate to me? Um, going further into problem solving and beginning to get a hold of algorithms. Um, and then unit three and four is when the more uh, traditional sounding programming and computer science comes in. So unit three is web development. So students learn uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, learn how some of those basics work in uh, creating a, a web page that uh, addresses a community problem. So rooting it in that kind of a project. And unit four is where um, more uh, traditional programming is introduced in the form of Scratch. So learning about uh, conditionals, variables, some of the introductory uh, elements of programming as it relates to like creating a game or creating a, a story uh, for the project in that unit. And then units five and six are where there's a little bit more adaptability or flexibility. So unit five is data analysis. Uh, so students work with um, public data sets and again, find things that are relevant and meaningful to them in their community and learn how um, some of the basics of data analysis work. And then unit six is uh, traditionally robotics, so physical computing. So again, working um, either with um, a version of Scratch or a different programming interface, depending on the robots that you're being that are being used. Um, learning again, like what is a robot? What is um, a way that I can make what I code interact with the world? And there are now uh, more alternative units being developed. So there's uh, artificial intelligence is another one. So introduction to AI as an alternative uh, into the course, as well as spacing in the other one. Oh, e-textiles. So another form of physical computing, uh, but something that's totally different and allows you to do many of the same things, have many of the same interactions and sensors, but in the context of weaving and uh, creating a, a physical object rather than using a physical object like a robot. 
I want to piggyback on that. I was at a meeting with teachers and a computer science teacher said, oh, in my computer science class, I like to throw some computer architecture at them to separate the men from the boys and see who really can do this work and who can't. And it reflected an attitude on teaching computer science that I think that's been prevalent of what it looks like and who belongs and who doesn't belong. And in the sense, you know, a lot of times we picture in our mind, who does a computer scientist look like? And we imagine white males or maybe Asians and um, doing programming, maybe in a basement without light, maybe with an energy drink and, and just hardcore programming. And that's what it is. When the group of faculty from around the United States were gathered together to design the new APCS principles course, and they were asked, what do you think is most important that needs to be a component to this course? The number one thing that came out was creativity. We want people to understand that computers are a powerful vehicle for expressing creativity and for making things and for doing things. Like Andy talked about the internet of things or e-textiles um, add-ons for computer science. But there's still this lingering notion of that computer science equals just programming. And that's something that we have to fight against if we want our students to feel like this is rel uh, relevant to them. And, um, and if we want to integrate it into this broad range of, of courses where it fits across the curriculum. Thank you. So Michelle has a question in the chat about if we had a wish list for what students should be able to do coming out of elementary and middle school, what would that be? This is another one where I'm happy to take a crack at answering, but uh, Julio, if you want the first shot, um, you're welcome to. I think for, mind you, I'm a high school person. <laughs> so I think to be able to take an idea, right? Communicate it with a team of people and you know, collaboratively work on what are the pieces that we would need to, to learn? What are the pieces that we would need to do? And maybe not be able to, you know, to, to code something super sophisticated, but at least to know their own thinking and to know the process of taking something from an idea to, to a, uh, a product, if you will, um, is one key, uh, key uh, skill, uh, collaboration, communication as well. Um, probably block coding at the very least um, coming out of elementary school. I think those are, I think those are, are pretty critical. I, I would add that the, there's this transition that is so important in computer science, which is ability to create. I mentioned creativity before. You know, there's a difference between following a recipe to make a pie and you could do lots of different pies. And then you're like, wait, I don't have a recipe for apricot, but if I, maybe I could just modify this strawberry recipe and maybe that'll work. And then you're like, well, maybe I can make tarts instead of pies. So that transition from just following things that are set up and consuming these systems that other people have created to then being able to make something of your own, like Julia talked a little bit about some, you know, communication with other people, but making something of your own, that is a, a critical skill and that can be done at all different levels. Um, I would also like to add that um, for those students who are fortunate enough to have exposure and experience with computer science, uh, coursework uh, or other experiences leading into high school, we have uh, with the help of the learning partnership and CAPACS developed a um, placement exam for students to place out of introductory computer science and go right into intermediate or advanced coursework. So um, we, we do recognize that um, we need to accommodate all types of students in regards to their computer science abilities. And I, I would add that that is that question is something that, that we are directly researching in terms of what what types of opportunities that students do have in elementary school that add value as they get into high school. And the Exploring Computer Science course was designed for those who've had no prior exposure to computer science. But you can imagine that as that initiative grows within the K-8 space, that that course may not be relevant for a number of students. And so I think looking to Exploring Computer Science is the kinds of abilities around computational thinking that would be ideal for elementary students to have. And I think 
some of these responses partly address uh, Mr. Mellon's question in the chat about is there a study guide or something for like how to get past that in, uh, mm -hmm. placement test? And I think what I'd emphasize is that um, nobody so far mentioned we need students to be able to like create certain kind of lambdas in Python or do certain things in Java uh, early on in order to pass out of the introductory computer science class. What's been touched on is like really working in a team collaboration, understanding the process of problem solving and of developing an algorithm, finding ways to be creative and again, work with others because those are the things that'll set you up for success. And if you're doing that in an elementary school computer science space, you're gonna be doing that in the context of like building a game or solving puzzles or making a website, uh, things that'll help with some of the content areas, but the content is always gonna change. Like as far as like what's most relevant in high school and beyond, the curriculum, the languages are gonna be adapting and those fundamental skills and practices related to computer science are what set you up for success in a computer science class in high school but also really a lot of other kinds of classes. If you know how to work in a team, if you're good at problem solving, you'll do really well across the board. And awesome, well, thank you so much, everybody. We're at the top of the hour, so I wanna be cognizant of everybody's time. We'll certainly stick around for a few minutes and continue answering questions if you guys want. But in case anybody does wanna drop off, um, I am going to share my screen. Um, so, um, so, okay, so first of all, I did put the link for the TDH in the chat. Um, it was the first one of the ones that I put in there. Um, the second link is our Wednesday webinar page on our website. This webinar will be up there by noonish tomorrow. Try to get up there tonight. Um, but we do put all of our webinars um, on that page. So definitely go ahead and check that out. You also, I did put in the chat earlier because um, I forgot to mention it in my housekeeping items. Uh, we were recording this session. So you will get a copy of the recording, um, a, the uh, presentation, which I know you also got the link to today. So we'll um, send the presentation out to you as well. And then finally, the chat file. So any of the stuff that went into the chat file, I will go ahead and link that and um, add that to tomorrow's email. The email will go out to everybody who registered tomorrow to so keep an eye out for that. Um, last but not least, I am sure you guys have heard, but we have our um, conference coming up this February. The entire month of February, it is 24 days of nothing but learning opportunities. Um, so awesome PDH opportunities, um, awesome learning, awesome PLN opportunities. We've collaborated with the um, Texas organization like ourselves, and um, we're combining our presenters. So you'll be able to uh, get some learning from folks out in Texas, see what they've got going on, if it's different than us or if it's the same, whatever. You'll get um, all kinds of great learning from the people in Illinois. So awesome, awesome, lots of opportunities. Stuff will be on demand too. So when it's dark out, go ahead and watch a video and watch a webinar and see um, what's going on. So go ahead, register, take advantage of this awesome learning opportunity this year um, in this new virtual environment. Um, you know, you could be anywhere and um, taking advantage of it. So please do that. Um, so you can register for that, that last link, our calendar link. If you scroll to the February um, 2021 IdeaCon event, you'll be able to hit the registration button there as well. Um, so that's it for me. Um, thank you so much, gentlemen. This was awesome. We really appreciate it. Lots of good conversation happening. Lots of great things happening um, throughout the state, throughout everywhere. But um, CS is definitely near and dear to my heart. That's what I was um, when I was in the classroom. That's what I taught. So uh, I truly appreciate this. And um, thank you for all the work that you guys are doing and this. 